Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming to EC Pro. Uh, here to show and talk about the latest and greatest Sony technology, this brand new camera known as the PXW FX9, but I'm sure you knew that already. Uh, so we do have a little PowerPoint presentation. Maybe somebody could try it. I'll try it. That'd be great. So we'll mix it up a little bit. We'll we'll do a little PowerPoint, reference the camera itself or some of the features and functions. And then afterwards, we can come up and play. Uh, feel free to ask questions along the way. Make it an open forum. And uh, let's get started. OK, so we're going to be uh, talking about three new products today. We're talking about three new products today, the uh, FX9, our uh, XDCA FX9, which is the extension unit for that specific camera, and a brand new lens that's part of a new line of cinema, our Cinema Line series. So the FX9 uh, is based on a lot of the same core technologies as our FS7 series. You're going to see a lot of similarities. Uh, but it is a completely different model. It is definitely a step up, and you'll see why as we move along. But we do have the core technologies of our XD Cam and XAVC Codex, our alpha mount system. Sony is a one mount system, all the way from our alpha series cameras, our FS5, 7, and now FX9, and of course the Venice, which you're probably all aware of as well. So all of those cameras, one single mount, a uh, boatload of lenses to use with those, and it's uh, really great uh, to have that capability where you have just one mount for every type of camera. So what we've done with the FX9 is we've taken some amazing technologies from other camera systems, and this is kind of unique for Sony and kind of new and refreshing uh, for me that over the years, we've had these amazing technologies, and it's like this group wants to just hold that technology for itself. But now we're sharing it across the board. And so we have this amazing technology of uh, the Venice camera, the full frame sensor, dual base ISO, um, amazing, uh, gorgeous color science. And then we have this, uh, our, our Alpha 7 series, which has this amazing autofocus tracking. So we've taken those brand new technologies that have made those camera systems so successful and we've combined that with an already successful FS7 and that gets you the FX9. So full frame for beautiful bokeh, nice shallow depth of field, take advantage of those wide angle full frame lenses. 15 stops of dynamic range and of course, the dual base size. So we'll get into the details of all of these things uh, as we move along. Uh, having the uh, full frame sensor, this is kind of a repetitive slide, so we'll skip past this really. Uh, but let's get to a little bit of a comparison. So over here on this side, we have the FS7 M2 in a super 35 sensor. You see 8.8 .8 million pixels. Yeah, the new FX9, 19 million pixels, so 6K full frame sensor. Now the question that comes up all the time is, is this camera going to be able to record the 6K? And the answer is no. Uh, we can do that with our Venice camera. There's no plans for the FX9 to do it. In fact, for the purposes of how this camera records, there's really no true benefit to recording the 6K. Because then you're back to the same drawing board of a 4K sensor for 4K recording, which doesn't give you the full color resolution that you would get when you scan 6K and record 4K. So technology differences here, we, we have a technology called Exmor. And Exmor isn't just a fancy name we slap on all of our cameras. It's actually a really impressive technology where we put A to D converters on each column of the sensor. And that allows us to get very fast read off and read that signal off as a digital signal right off the chip. 
rather than sending an analog signal through electronics and having that signal be contaminated by electronic interference, therefore adding more noise to your video image, we've eliminated that process, greatly reducing the noise level on our video cameras. When you combine XMOR R, or the R with XMOR, now we've got a whole other level of improvement with uh, signal to noise, sensitivity, and dynamic range. So essentially with a traditional CMOS sensor, it's front illuminated structure, there's metal wiring that is needed in a traditional CMOS sensor and, and that blocks light from being able to hit the sensor. So we sort of flipped it around with this XMOR R technology, making it a back illuminated structure, essentially meaning the electronics are behind the light gathering areas of the sensor. So now we've improved the sensitivity and the dynamic range. We've gone from 14 stops with the FS7 series to 15 plus stops with the FX9. And that is a real number that's been measured in real time. There's some fancy device, I don't remember the name of it to you. Um, oh, the, the dynamic range chart? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, the German one. Yeah, uh, it's a very expensive device, but uh, I was doing a workshop in, up in Canada with Alistair Chapman, and uh, he was on site for this measurement. And not only were they impressed with the extra stops, but how clean the shadow detail was in those extra stops. So let's talk a little bit about what the camera's capabilities will be uh, in terms of right out of the box. Uh, please note that there will be some features that will come in a later firmware upgrade. Uh, this is nothing new for Sony. We've done that very successfully with our F5 and F55 cameras. And it certainly would be like cheating you out of six months or so of using this amazing camera if we waited until it was completely finished, which no camera ever is. So we'll start off with frame rates. What you'll see here is check marks and check marks with asterisks. So anything with an asterisk essentially means that the camera will have that feature during that next firmware upgrade, which will be summer of 2020. So for instance, you look down here on the Super 35 mode. So this is a full frame sensor, but it has two operating points, the full frame mode and the Super 35 mode. So in the Super 35, UHD and HD, we've got our frame rates 24, 25, 30, and 60 right out of the box. In the full frame mode, you see we stop here at 30 initially for UHD, and we do have the 60p available at 1080. And then both in Super 35 and full frame modes, the DCI spec will come later on with that firmware upgrade. Over here, you'll see an extra little uh, note here in parentheses, a crop mode. So it's not going to be completely a 6K scan for the 60p, more like probably 5.7, but uh, there's still plenty of uh, information there to get a really nice quality image when you are in that full frame 60p mode. High frame rates will also be available on the camera. And again, in full frame, check 100 and 120. So this is going to operate a little bit different than FS7. So how many FS7 users here? A couple, two, three. Okay, great. So in the FS7, it goes 1 to 120, 1 to 180, continuous depending on the codec you're using. Here, these are going to be specific high frame rate uh, speeds, so 100 and 120. Uh, and then with the firmware upgrade, 150 and 180, that's in the full frame mode. Down in Super 35, we have 100 and 120. There will not be a higher than that in, in Super 35 uh, mode in this camera, at least internally. Externally, however, using the XDCA, which we'll see in a short while, uh, we do have the ability to give you a 4K 120 continuous. It'll be a 10-bit raw signal from the XDCA FX9. So that's really nice. 4K 120 continuous. 
So we talked, uh, I mentioned earlier in the presentation about sharing these amazing technologies. This has been blowing people away. This is the fast hybrid autofocus system. It's, it was originally developed for our Alpha 7 series cameras and it's made that line of cameras extremely successful. Here we have 561 points. Again, this is a brand new sensor designed specifically for this camera. So we've got 561 points nearly 100% coverage of your phase detection autofocus points. So when I say it's a fast hybrid autofocus system, it's combining both phase detection, P-H-A-S-E, and I say that because there's also phase detection, and also contrast-based focus. So phase detection is object recognition. It knows how far away the object is. It goes to that distance in the focus, and then the contrast-based this kicks in for that extra accuracy. The beauty of having phase detection is even in lighting that's not optimum, the camera still focuses very quickly. And um, in situations where contrast base would fail, the phase detection is really effective. Not only do we have the focus points, and I don't know if everybody could see the camera here, but we've got a bunch of different parameters that can be used while you're in this autofocus mode. This is a screen grab from the camera. So you can see there's transition speed. Those, uh, that transition speed ranges from one to seven. And then there's an object, uh, subject shift sensitivity. Say that one five times fast. Uh, so that speeds one through five. So in the transition speed, it's how fast do I want the focus to actually occur? Do I want thing, something a little bit more slow and natural, or do I want that instantaneous fast focus if I'm doing something like sports? On the other side here, how quickly do I want it to switch from one subject to another? So it first recognizes the subject and then does the focus speed. Okay? So here I can go from locked on. So if I've got this couple, they're the uh, bride and groom, the, you know, they're they're the special stars of this video, and a couple goes dancing in front of them, the camera will actually stay locked on that subject rather than hunt on somebody else and then have to go back. So that hunting that you're so familiar with seeing with contrast-based focus, it's not really gonna be happening here. So uh, you're gonna be really excited when you see how well this works. And then also, over here, I can switch extremely fast. So in, the, in a situation with a car race where one car leaves the scene, you're on the corner of the track and that car leaves the scene, you want it to quickly switch over to the next car and focus fast. So when you combine those two parameters together, you get a whole lot of options what you can do. Then kick in the face detection and you have even more options. So we have face priority and face only. Uh, there's different applications where they would be useful. If I'm doing phase priority and you have, what's the most common thing? We have a person standing in front of a podium and we're shooting that and that stupid microphone makes the camera search back and forth, right? Uh, I remember those days. Uh, anyway, with phase priority, the camera will prioritize a face if a face is in the scene. If the face leaves the scene, so maybe you have some folks walking through a scene and they'll focus all the way through. As soon as they leave the scene, the camera will then focus on whatever else is in the scene. With face only, the camera will not readjust the focus. So you can do some pretty nice creative things, or have folks leave the scene and leave that background stay out of focus and have that nice soft bokeh cut to your next scene. Face registration, is what you do when you use the joystick and you actually select the face so the camera's going to see a bunch of different faces in a scene that it recognizes and it can do it even in some pretty challenging lighting environments and then what I, what I can do is move the joystick to the face that I want to have in focus, push that joystick in and that face is registered. You can register one face at a time. If you want to register another face, move it over to another person push the joystick in, and now you stay on that person. Now, if I combine that with the different elements, bless you, of, when I combine that with the different elements, 
and the different parameters of my focus, I can add locked on to that face. So if I walk in front of that subject, the camera is not going to bother looking at me at all. It's going to stay locked on that face. So this works really amazing. I don't know if there's going to be a video output to this screen, but uh, in these environments, you see how quickly it grabbed a face. Hope you don't mind. We're not recording this part, so don't be uh, too nervous there. The uh, camera knows who you are. You can see, even as we get into some lower light environments, and even if I think if I go to... Now, if, it, if the background is extremely out of focus, it's, it may not recognize somebody. But you, there you see, all the way even in the back there, I, I just pushed it a little bit to be in focus, and it will just do a really nice job of focusing on any type of face in any kind of lighting environment. And that's really pretty dark over there. Okay, so that's uh, everything to do with our fast hybrid autofocus system. We play around with that a little bit more uh, afterwards. Uh, there, Additionally, you can combine that with a, a manual focus override or just use the one push autofocus. And I know a lot of you are I mean, we're all professionals here, and I've always joked about autofocus. Say, nobody uses autofocus because we're all professionals, right? Well, I can't say that anymore because every professional that I've seen uh, speak about it, uh, some of the big, you know, the more uh, common names in the industries, the Yalister Chapmans, the Doug Jensen's, they've experienced this autofocus and say, I can't do as good as the camera does. So I'm going to use it. There's no reason why I wouldn't. So, uh, and especially as we get a little bit more advanced in our careers and our eyes start failing us, even though we have this higher resolution viewfinder, having that autofocus, especially when you're dealing with a full frame sensor that's going to give you such shallow depth of field. Think about a person sitting, you're doing a, a sit down interview and, and it just takes maybe an inch or two leaning forward or back and you're out of focus again, and you don't know, you can't predict when they're going to do that. You know, some people are a little bit more nervous than other. This camera will track that and not miss a beat. And it's tracking faces, not eyes? It's tracking faces at the moment. Because, you know, your, your so, $1,000 RX100 tracks face, tracks eyes. It's also a touch screen. This, this is true. A touch screen, you know? This does not have touch screen. Uh, not at the moment. It's been asked for. The beauty of firmware is things can be done. Um, I'm hoping that we do, um, that we advance it into eye as well. Uh, but so far from what I've seen in the face, it's not, the eyes are looking like they're in focus. And, but I'll let you be the judge, you can get a closer look at that. Well, that again depends on what your setup is. Like yeah. The shallow depth of field, you could have a nose that looks great, and the eyes too soft. Mm -hmm. Agreed, agreed. Uh, and again, the, some of our, I think the A7 III camera, when it first was introduced, did face only, and through a firmware upgrade, we added eye. So I can only say I anticipate that it could happen, but it's not technically in the roadmap yet. And touchscreen, that isn't firmware, is it? No. No, the, the panel it's itself would have to be that. And, you know, the I, viewfinder the, or something. The touchscreen is nice, but when you. When you're dealing on a professional level, I think touching the screen all the time and getting fingerprints all over it, and then when you want to look at the picture, you're having to wipe it all off. For, for this form factor, you're less likely to use it if you're shooting like with an RX where you can put the camera exactly. in place. Then it really comes in handy. Exactly. Yeah, so there's definitely a place for a touch screen. Um, I think for this camera, it probably isn't the best. Yeah. Now, say, I'm looking at your face, Tom, if you're talking. Yes, sir. Okay. Now, I, I, I'm sort of critical, especially when I'm shooting. I, I like to see my ears and everything. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times, like you said, old eyes. Now, I'm constantly doing. Would that, would, would your ears be in focus also? Well, there's a you lot. You said face. There, there's a mean? lot uh, is going to be determined on the depth of field that you choose. So, remember, this camera is full frame and super 35. So I may, you know, it's not going to be a situation where you're going to always just use super, uh, always use full frame. There's a stop difference between if you, if you have an F, this lens here is an F4 aperture, full, um, fully open. In super 35 mode, it's an F4, 
in full frame, it's equivalent to a 2B. So, uh, so you have that full stop with difference. So adjust accordingly. Now the beauty is this camera is so amazingly sensitive that you're not going to always have to shoot wide open. What you, so you can, uh, I can say for instance, I can immediately, if I look at the picture, all of this is in focus, but I'm, I, I'm in the ears, I, I want to just mm -hmm. tweak it a little bit. Will I be able to override it and tweak it just a little bit that fast? You yeah. can override it. You okay. can override uh, it. And if you need a little bit take? more, just just close your aperture down a little bit. That's all. Okay. Or shoot in Super 35 instead of full frame. Yeah. And, and that's, again, because... I, I, how I'm seeing this camera being used is when you do those creative shots, the sit downs, the things where you want that really shallow depth of field, that really soft background, you would be in your full frame mode. And then if there's more run and gun type stuff, you've got somebody on a stage, you probably want to have a little extra depth of field. Well, that's so what I'm so you would go switch to your Super 35 mode. So that's the versatility of having a full frame sensor. And you can and you can shoot in both of those modes. But great questions. Please yeah. keep them coming. Tom, uh, one one general point about depth of field is that really your iris dictates ninety nine percent of how much space or how little space you're going to have in focus. So I mean, it's it's the same principle as why we squint when uh, when you're trying to see something further. If it's in focus to you, it's a it's a beam of light that's hitting your eye directly. So really, the camera can't unless it's an auto iris can't change your depth of field. So, I mean, you could get an app, there's even an old paper calculator from, from the ASC days where, you know, if you're at an F2.8 on a full frame sensor, you'll know you have six inches of focus from where you put, it, you know, three in front, three in back. So, you know, that's why sports, you almost always see, you know, baseball games, it's an F F8. Because you have to be able to see about 20, 40 feet of distance. Um, you know, traditional ENG Dateline style interviews, you're not going to be over, you're not going to be under a 2.4 because, you know, you're going to be on a lit stage and they, they do want to see the ears, you know, like that. There's a lot of money going into that hair. We're going to see it. Um, you know, if anybody ever came to you and said, hey, we're going to do walking down the street in Manhattan at full frame 6K on a 1.4 lens wide open, it's a trap. I mean, that, that's what somebody's just proposed to you. <laughs> Um, you you know. Well, and, but that's where like you're going to turn on every autofocus feature under the sun and hope like that person doesn't have a twin that walks down the street just to completely confound the situation. But that's really the, the main principle at play for controlling your depth of field. Your iris dictates everything. Thanks, Joe. Well, moving on. All right. This is one of my favorite slides. Uh, so I've been a sales support engineer for almost 16 years. It'll be in April, it'll be 16 years. And one of the things that uh, we do as sales support engineers is we get the voice of the customer. Believe it or not, we actually do listen. And so I take the feedback that I hear in the field and I pass it up the chain. It goes to product management and then they talk to Japan. And Sometimes they do things, sometimes they don't. But really, as a, as a whole, Sony does, I think, an amazing job of utilizing customer feedback they listen for Kaizen, which is the Japanese word for improvement, and then we try to implement that the best we can and still keep the camera in an affordable price point. Um, in this case, we even, I think, added a little bit more. So, uh, the good news is with accessories, most of the accessories you would currently be using for your FS7 are going to work with this camera. I want to say most. There's some slight, slight design changes. I'd say little things like this handle here ramps up just a tiny bit. So we've had to call some of our third party cheese plate accessory folks that uh, had difficulty sliding through there. So maybe a slight modification there. The viewfinder shape, or I should say the LCD panel shape is a little bit different, so Zakudo is already aware of that, and they've already gone through making whatever adjustments for that accessory is necessary as well. Uh, I'm actually visiting Zakudo next week again, doing a FX9 live interview, so um, you could check that out if you're into Zakudo products. <laughs> little plug for me. Yeah. 
<laughs> is, is there the Zakudo uh, plate at the bottom? The, uh, is that off of an FI7? Let's say if I've got one, would that fit? That'll, that's going to fit. Yeah, in fact, when I, when I first brought the camera over to Zakudo, the only accessory they had that didn't fit perfectly was the uh, viewfinder piece, which they had to make a modification. But yeah, in fact, even on the Sony side, the uh, VCT FS7, the shoulder mount, is the same one that would be used for the FX9. It's going to be a little confusing because it's not, you know, it's the different numbers, but it does fit. Yes. Um, I have two questions from uh, potential buyers, and they were asking one: Are they going to be changing? Are you going to have a third-party um, lens mount, so like EF to E? That they're going? Are they going to have to change that? And are they going to have to change also the um, the back for the V mount or brick mount adapter? That or will you be able to still use the one that's, um, I think, the QR7 that we use? All right. For, yeah, no, there's a different, two. okay. So as far as the mount goes, this is still E-mount. It's the same exact mount as an FS7M2 with that locking style E-mount. That being said, it's a brand new camera and there's different communication going on. So some of the adapters that are working with an FS7 may not work as well with this camera. That's going to be obviously the third-party companies, the, um, the the Sigmas, the MTFs, the uh, Metabones. They're all have the ability to update their firmware to improve that. Uh, I have at other locations tried the adapters, and with some success. Uh, of course, nothing beats the combination of a Sony lens and a Sony camera. And it's not just because we made some secret proprietary thing, uh, but really it's the performance of our focus mechanism in our lenses. Uh, we have cutting edge technology where we're able to just move a single element forward and back very fast, very accurately, and very quietly. Uh, whereas other manufacturers' focus has to move the entire uh, group of lenses circularly, which requires a bigger motor, it's louder, and it's slower. So you're not going to get the same super fast performance with that fast hybrid autofocus system. So um, while it's you know a great to have with your Sony lenses, it'll still work with some of the other stuff, it just won't work as well. And you'll see you know, maybe that's your reason now for switching over completely to Sony Glass if you haven't already. Uh, but it's nothing we're doing on purpose except for making awesome lenses and having the communication to talk to those lenses as well. So the rule of thumb is all mechanical adapters will be fine because it's the same mount, but anything that's electronic driven to drive somebody, another manufacturer's electronics, it has to be a case-by-case -case basis. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So let's let's talk PL world. Mm -hmm. Sure. Currently, the Venice you can pop on a PL lens, and it's just going to work like you're popping on a two-thirds inch with sure. power and metadata passing through the camera. Mm -hmm. How easy is that for me? Uh, well, power and metadata for PL. I don't know about. I don't know oh, power. <laughs> so with the FS7, because this is not our first rodeo with having E-mount camera where PL lenses are being used. Uh, with the FS7 series, uh, there were uh, adapters for going from E-mount to PL and power would be coming separate <coughs> using the extension unit. So we're not powering to, where's Bob, is Bob here? He stepped, out for a he stepped out for a minute. He stepped out. Well, we'll see if we can answer that question when Bob comes back. Uh, Bob Van Bodigan from Fujinon is here today. Okay. So we can have that. The Venice has that yeah. capability of sure. Well, there is not an actual in-body power out. So any kind of power would come from the extension unit. There is uh, both a D-tap and a Hiroshi connector on that D-tap. There he is. Hey, Bob. Bob, as far as power and PL lenses with the FX9 and or FX7 well, series. Let's well, say, for instance, I want to take my 85 to 300. Sure. And pop it on that. It'll go on that. Um, How's it going to operate? Um, I don't think there's a there's not a 12 pin connector no. on no. that. So you would have to take a power supply from uh, a battery 
from um, uh, PTAP to a serial. Okay, so it's not, it's, not it's not it's not communicating with the camera. I'm not going to see Does any information like I would. Um, is there a hot shoe in there? Uh, the email's a hot shoe, but I don't so, know if what so adapters are available that have hot shoe shoes. For, that we would be specific to the PL then, it's whether it would be LDS yeah. or, yeah. or uh, All of you know, a high Cook I series, because we should support camera. that if it's Except a, for power, yeah. it's the only standard. Thing that you can't get from this. Okay, so it, it's... Right, you have a, the PL mount has all of your information coming back your feedback coming back as well. Uh, the fine print being, it has to be a Cook I series metadata protocol because we play with Cook I series metadata, is which it, is yeah. which okay. is an open source standard for, for lens. Yeah, I have it on my F5. I set it up a yeah. years ago, and I don't go back and touch it again. It's yeah. just information that's... But we would have to double... Video. It's a case-by-case case when it comes to adapters just because they can be, you know, kind of individual works a lot of the time. So while there is a hot mount, whether it passes the right amount of voltage to power said lens is, is an open question. Whether can it understand the protocol coming out and translate it to the viewfinder is just another thing we have to check when it comes to pairing for configurations for, for work or sale. So we, we have to double check those things on a case by case, generally speaking. So I'm going to guess it's all going to communicate similar to the, your, you know, your F5, but you're not going to get power from it. You're going to have to have an external power supply. That's your only obstacle with this. That's what I see okay. without testing. Yeah, this, some of the stuff with the lenses as we move forward, the camera actually getting out there. And once we start shipping, we'll have uh, more information as well. But I will say this, there's not an adjustment. There's not a setting within the camera like the F5 where you can choose Cook Eye or, yeah, or LDS. Or or LDS. So. Uh, that may not be the case, um, so just uh, I, and I believe the best way to power it would be use the extension unit with the power tap on it, and then power the lens. That's been the configuration for uh, even going from E mount to B4 lenses as well until our new B4 adapter came out, but that's for the FS7. I have a lens here. Yeah, we can check it out afterwards. Great. But is it going to, are you going to need a different back though for the, uh, from the QRS7? Yes. To adapt? Yeah, the, the, the XD, XDCA FS7 is not going to be compatible with a FX9. No, I mean, no, I know that, but the, a lot of the guys don't want to use the BPU90 batteries. They want to be able to use either a brick or a V-mount battery. So yeah. there are the adapters. For the FS7, is it going to be different ones for yeah. the FX9? Yeah, there's um, there's a difference in voltage requirements. That's uh, the FX9 is a, is 19 volt, but there are I think at least one company out there right now that have already developed. Core. Um, I think it's Hawk 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 Guy or. Still the Core SWX. I'm sorry. Core SWX developed a bracket. Core SWX. I have one. Okay. Core SWX and I think a company called Hawk. Yeah, and they're doing a voltage conversion right. on that adapter as well, so that'll get you there. So there will be products out there, um, so that's good news. That. So moving on, uh, this uh, couple of new functionality features, remember we talked about the improvement and Kaizen and, and, and adding more. So a lot of the functionality of an FS7 <laughs> was great, but there was a lot of feedback on why can't I change my white balance without having to go into the menu? And why can't I uh, control channels three and four audio without having to go into the menu? So again, we listened and we redesigned the panel so that you could do those type of things. So we added channels three and four, so there's physical pots for those extra channels. Not only that, but there's routing switches that allow you to put your wireless audio on any of the channels, one and two included. Whereas in the FS7 series, wireless always had to be on channels three and four. So, and wireless audio can also come using the new XDCA, which we'll talk about soon. Over here, I've got my ISO gain button, 
my white balance button, my shutter button, my iris button, if I hit any one of those, then it activates this multi-function dial and I can dial in those values. So hit my white balance button, turn the dial, and I can dial in any white balance. If I'm in preset, it's going to move at 100 degree Kelvin increments. If I'm in one of the memories, I can shift that white balance either direction. So if you're in preset and you do that, is it then, and, and you move it, it then stays there? It stays there, yeah. correct. Yeah, it stays there whether it's a memory or a preset. And then if you go into the menu for white balance, you can even shift the tint on the memory. So there's a lot of adjustments you can do with white balance. Uh, and but mostly you can make those general adjustments right here with that multifunction dial without entering the menu. Uh, another nice thing about the buttons is that who, who here's used an FS7 and accidentally hit the buttons and they go into auto mode and you don't realize it, right? Uh, so again, we listen to feedback. See your voice is heard, and now in. in in order to get these buttons to go into auto mode, you actually have to push and hold them in. And then it lights up green to let you know you're in auto. So we're saving your tail. Uh, additionally, we put the auto ND button, which is a very useful tool when you're using the variable ND. And uh, that allows you to free up another assignable button. You don't have to remember which one did I make, the auto ND. Uh, it's right there, right in the same area as the ND filter. And if you look, actually, there's no more dial for ND, so we'll, one less moving part here. We have a plus minus function for the ND. And if we also roll this variable dial here, I can just turn the dial up and roll in the ND at that point. So I don't even have to hit another button, I can just turn the wheel and only deal with the wheel as far as variable ND goes, as long as your switch is in the proper position. So audio, multifunction dial, uh, and four channels, we can move on. Ah, oop, okay. Sorry, so just like the FS7 series, the FX9 does have built-in variable ND. We just spoke about that, so you have the plus or minus to engage it, or simply roll the wheel for a variable. You do have the preset or variable switch and the auto ND button. We are still the only manufacturer having a variable ND built into the camera. So we've done it with three chip third inch cameras, we've done it with three chip half inch cameras. We're doing, we did it with Super 35 and now we're doing it with full frame and we're the only one. So this is Sony only technology. If you've not experienced variable ND, you must. Uh, particularly with a camera like this, where you're shooting full frame and you have that shallow depth of field. Think about your outdoors, maybe you're, you're doing some type of interview and you need to throw that background out of focus because there's just a bunch of stuff there and that's really your only choice of shooting the way the sunlight's hitting, whatnot, and building up this like kind of rigid scenario. So I want to shoot wide open with my lens. I mean, maybe I've got a nice uh, 1.4, 24 millimeter Sony E-mount lens. It's a G Master. It's a beautiful lens. I have one here we can throw on later. And I want to shoot wide open to get that super, super shallow depth of field. Well, a lot of times what would happen is if you don't have a variable ND, I gotta throw my ND on, and one is too much, and the other one's not enough. So then what do I have to do? I have to change my aperture. And then I lose my creative control about my depth of field. So using variable ND, I simply engage that. I dial in just the right amount of ND. It's two to seven stops in one-third stop increments. So you've got a lot of control there. Or simply just hit the auto ND button and let the camera do it for you. Uh, that's also helpful when you're doing that same type of shoot and you have those, one of those days where it's sunny and cloudy and the clouds are drifting in and out. Every time you have to make a, an exposure change, you would be changing your depth of field if you're adjusting your aperture. But having auto ND 
your aperture stays the same, and then so does your depth of field. Now when you want to change your depth of field, you can do what's called a depth of field pull. So I simply focus on my subject, and I can either pull a background out of focus or go in reverse and put it into focus. So we'll say I want to bring in the background. I would start with a very shallow depth of field, wide open. I'm on my initial subject. The background is soft and out of focus. He's talking about his childhood home. And then right in the background, as I open my or close my aperture down, the auto ND is adjusting on the fly, basically making it look like there's no exposure change. And the only thing that happens is the background changes from being out of focus to revealing the home behind the subject. It's a really nice creative tool. I think in uh, Hollywood they have to do that by dollying and and heaven and earth have been pushed to do moves like that yeah. traditionally. Yeah, and, and before we had cameras with variable ND and large sensor cameras, I didn't even I never even heard of a depth of field pull. So um, it's really cool, <laughs> um, and it's definitely a, a, a tool that can give you additional creativity. Okay. So I think I mentioned briefly before about the new LCD panel. So it is a 1280 by 720 panel. A uh, previous panel was 960 by 540, so we're nearly doubling the resolution. It's also much brighter. So your experience of focusing, if you do choose to focus manually, will be nice. Um, uh, but if you still have difficulty, feel free to turn on the fast hybrid autofocus. Um, the EVF tube transforms into a sunshade. So we progressed a little bit. We had just the tube on the FS7, then we had a tube and a sunshade that you could swap out for the FS7 M2 series. Now with this one, it's all combined. So I have this button here, I push, and I could just flip this up when I want to use the sunshade, click it back down if I want to use the tube, if I want to remove it completely. It's a little tongue and groove, slides right out. Very similar to the way our ENG uh, EVFs work. Uh, let's see, yeah, next, next, next. Okay, some more improvements. The hand grip. So we have a couple different model uh, cameras that have a smart grip. We have the FS7 series, we have the FS5 series. Well, after the FS5 came out, people were commenting like, oh wow, I like this grip better. Can't you put this grip on that camera? Okay, so we did. So we took the FS5 grip that has that direct menu access button on it, so you can access menu items on screen when it's on your shoulder, right from your hand grip. It's also got the strap around it, so not only will you have a more efficient shooting experience, but a more secure shooting experience by utilizing that hand strap. And then we changed the communication to the camera to a USB multi. So now we've got faster communication to the lens. So this SELP, this Powers Servo Zoom Lens, the 28 to 135, on the original FS7, there were some issues about how smoothly it could ramp up and ramp down. Not an issue anymore, because we had that faster communication with the lens. We added Genlock to the body. That was probably the biggest request. Why do I have to buy an XDCA FS7 just to get time code? It's a very big expense just to get time code. That's fine if you're utilizing the raw outputs of the camera, but just to get time code in Genlock, a lot of folks weren't too happy about that. So in body, time code in Genlock, right on the back of the camera, right in the same area, you'll see your SDIs and your HDMI's. There is also a 12G out on SDI1 as well as a 3G on SDI2 and HDMI. So you have all your connections, all your outputs, time code in Genlock, so you can buy multiple FX9's and use them all together with lock time code. Uh, we've got proxy file recording. So on the same SD card that you would save your utility files, 
be the magic camera, your LUTs, your user menu items. Um, now you can also record proxy. The proxy can be up to a 9 megabit 1920 by 1080, uh, I believe it's an MP4, and you can go all the way down to 0.5 on the file size. So uh, a lot of flexibility. The 1920, 1080 is broadcast quality. It's the same quality that the camera would give you when it does a live stream, 1920, 1080. So that's a great feature there. Uh, additionally, what's not on any of the slides, we have the ability to do a simultaneous, very similar to the F555, simultaneous 4K and HD recording onto the same card. So that would be an XABC 4K and an MPEG HD uh, recording for your, your, that could be somewhat of a proxy as well, but you can do HD and 4K to the same card, or you can do a proxy of your HD or a proxy of your 4K. Can't do all three at once, but you can do any combination of those two. Okay. So dual base ISO. Anybody familiar with dual base ISO at all? A little bit? Yeah. So our Venice camera, which has been highly successful, if you're not familiar with it, uh, when Top Gun Maverick hits the theaters next year, uh, that camera is currently in production with our Venice camera. Uh, as will be the next four Avatar movies, I think Wine Country was the first major, uh, feature released with uh, Venice, and a uh, variety, a ton of shows on Netflix and the like, including uh, Blacklist, switched over. And not only have they switched over from our 55 cameras to the Venice camera, but also have switched over from our competitors' cameras to the Venice as well. So the Venice has some amazing technologies in it. The color science is incredible. And the dual base ISO. So we've all had our experiences shooting with a base ISO and having to shoot, uh, like rate the camera lower so you overexpose so you get cleaner video, things like that. Having a dual base ISO it's kind of like having two cameras in one, right? I have one camera that's really great in outdoor lighting. It's got great dynamic range. Uh, let's say here, a camera with like an 800 ISO would be really wonderful outdoors. Uh, and then I've got another camera that I use for my lower light, my night scenes, and that camera has a pretty amazing 4000 ISO. So how cool would it be that you're actually changing the sensitivity of the camera, right? When you crank your ISOs on a single base ISO camera, you're not changing the sensitivity of the camera. You're basically turning the volume up on the picture. When you change the brightness, when the brightness goes higher, so does the noise, right? In a dual base ISO, there is a slight increment of noise, but not relative to the amount of ISO or the amount of sensitivity you're gaining from making that switch. Not only that, but our dynamic range remains the same. So in this 800 mode, I'm 6 over and 9 under. And in this 4000 mode, I'm 6 over and 9 under. And it is really amazing. I think we did switch over to that when I was showing off the uh, variable ND filter. So we are right now in a low base ISO, and if we go to maybe some of the darker scenes over here, you can see our autofocus at work. And then we hit the base ISO and move up to 4000. I have actually need to kick in ND here, and I'm at F4. And you can come up close to the display you're really not seeing uh, very much noise added to the image. So let's kick in our variable ND. And we could even raise that ISO. So again, I'm just going to hit my ISO button. I have full range of the camera. So I can keep that up. Where are we at? There we go. Yeah, we're at 10,000 right now. And you can come up nice and close to the monitor. 
and you'll see we're really getting beautiful images. So now you've got a lot of flexibility. The, the noise level, even when you are turning the volume up on the higher ISO, is still super clean. Super, super clean. Yes, sir? I think I've seen this punk, punch around on the forums a little bit. You are, if you are in the 800 base mode, it would be improper to gain all the way up in 800 to try to get to 4,000 or something like that because you will get more noise than if you started in, four, in the 4,000 mode and then manipulated your ISO from there. It's two different power systems for the imager, and that's how the noise is managed. Yes, and to Joe's point, if you look at the range in our base ISO, so this base ISO is when you're in the Cine EI mode. So it's 800 ISO, it goes from 200 to 3200. And then in the 4000 side, I've got from 1000, so you can see there's an overlap of several stops, 1000 all the way up to 16,000. Now at 16,000 you do actually see some noticeable noise, but it's not even noise that, you would, that would be completely unacceptable. But to Joe's point, if I need to be at 2,500 or 3,200, rather than being 800 and punch that up, I'm actually going to go from 4,000 and bring that down. And I'm going to lose maybe a, a little bit of dynamic range, but I'm gaining so much more well, you're shifting. on the sensitivity, right? Yeah, I'm shifting my dynamic range down into the shadow detail, which is where I want to have it anyway in that circumstance. No problem. Next. I still have the uh, ability, just like in the FS7 series, to be in that Cine EI mode, to shoot in your S-Log gamma curves, and then color grade. And then we also developed a new color science based, again, on the Venice camera, which has been a, a huge hit for us, probably on the high-end digital cinema side, probably our the, the best camera we've made to date. And a big reason for that is the color science. And I know uh, Joe had a lot of involvement in the Venice launch, and he can maybe go into a little bit more detail of the color science itself. I don't want to undersell, but the shortest way to put that is we brought in our design engineers and we put them, we just kind of let the ASC eat them alive. And then we brought them around all the major post houses and let all the major colorists eat them alive and show them at that point, when you think about when the Venice was coming out, there were some other cameras that were just sort of, oh, the skin tones are great in that one. The skin tones are crap in this one. And we made sure that our folks that take the math and then turn that into color had a deep, deep conversation in what the visual expectations were for skin tone. Because um, some of that is lo literally lost in translation between the mother language of these design engineers because they're not cinematographers, they're engineers, they're, they're scientists. And they had a very long feedback conversation about where to place color. You know, do, do, I mean, we need you to emphasize more shades of peach than we need you to care about subtleties and transitions of blue in the sky. You know, put your horsepower here, don't worry about you know, having it in other places. And the result of that conversation was the Venice's color science, which turned the, into an actual mathematical table to translate the color that comes off of the imager, Im imager and place that when shooting subjects so that you, know, you can see depth in shades of pink as opposed to being able to see the nuances in weird shades of yellow. You know, and all that was rolled into the feedback that created this, the color science for the Venice. And once you kind of create that new pack of crayons that we can now use internally, we can then take that and translate it into the Venice. You know, with, but you have to always account for the imager. You know, that's the canvas we're painting on. So then you tweak it a little bit, and that's why we can implement cin S, S Cinetone here. Exactly. Thank you, Joe. No problem. Yeah. So to Joe's point, we took the expertise we gained from what we created with the Venice, and initially, when the FS5M2 came out, we part of what was different about that camera than the original FS5 was in picture profile one, or when the profiles were off, we had that 
Venice look, that Venice type of color science, obviously a completely different sensor, but people were very pleased with the look of the camera in that particular mode. So again, that same technology, another brand new sensor, full frame like the Venice, but otherwise completely different, uh, that we took that expertise and we created what's called s -Cinetone. So this is a out-of-the-box look. You turn the camera on, it's going to show up as when you go to your gamma curve, where it would normally say uh, standard or STD, and then you had your uh, hypergammas and your S-logs. There's an additional category called original, and the only setting in that original is the s cinetone gamma curve. And then when you go to your color matrix, again, the same thing, there's an additional setting for s cinetone as your color. Now the color in s cinetone, uh, the, the blacks are a little bit deeper, and there's probably a tweak more color than what you would see in the S709 lookup table that is utilized when you go into Cine EI mode. So that S709 is the same look that is in the Venice, so it's a similar look. It would certainly help you match up those cameras in, an, in a situation where you needed a B camera or additional cameras to go along with the Venice shoot. Uh, but this s cinetone is really for folks that, one, don't have the experience of color grading, and two, don't have the time. So maybe you're a, good, you're a great colorist, but you've got to turn a project around really fast. You need it to look good. You can be confident in what you're getting from this s cinetone. You can see right here on the display, the, the flesh tones look amazing. I mean, I've not had a single person say anything but positive things about the look right out of the box of the camera. Now, if you do want to tweak the s cinetone, you could turn on the user matrix and you can play around with that as well. But we feel that, that this is really a, a color that people are going to fall in love with. So image stabilization is uh, something we're doing a little bit different on this camera. We have a lot going on with the sensor and the variable ND and the phase detection autofocus. So we chose to do what we thought the most efficient way of doing image stabilization is doing it in a post process. So the camera has a built-in gyro and it can read information from the lenses. Unfortunately, this, in this case, it's definitely only E-mount lenses only. So it needs to have that information as well. And from that, that information gets recorded in meta metadata. And then using Catalyst Browse, which is a free version of uh, software on our website, or the paid version as well, and you'll be able to add as little or as much image stabilization as you'd like. Now, think of the advantages there. Uh, I left image stabilizer on when I was on a tripod, and you get that weird artifact. Or maybe you have a tripod on a podium, and you didn't realize it was going to be a little bit shakier than you thought, and you didn't always want to have it on, but just every once in a while that tripod got bumped and you needed to stabilize the image, you can add that in post. Or maybe a particular walk around shot, you want to add a little bit of stabilization, or if you're decided all of a sudden that you had to run with the camera, you want to add a lot. So you've got a lot of flexibility in doing it in the post process. The beauty is it happens extremely fast, a 1080 60p clip of six seconds takes 0.1 seconds to apply the image stabilization. That's about 600 times faster than current NLE environments, uh, which by the way we are uh, working with our NLE partners in order to have this be implemented within that environment so that it would be even a smoother workflow for you. And is it cro always cropping into the image to create? Uh, it may have to, depending on how much image stabilization. So obviously, the more image stabilization you add, the, the more you're going to crop in. But uh, you, you've got plenty of resolution to deal with here. What, when is that software going to be out to really see it, other than a cell phone video off a monitor at, on the IBE floor? Um, well, this uh, version. 2019.2, that version 2019.2 is uh, 
December release. So my the guess... The 23rd. <laughs> my guess is it's probably right after. around the same time the camera ships that firmware. It's camera, they're shipping in Europe right now, I'm um, Yeah. So the camera's out in the free world. Camera's out well, in the free world. Well, that's just, you know, the U.S. should have gotten more pre-orders in. That's, uh, that's well, what that tells you. Just, like, you guys let us down. <laughs> Don't blame the customer. <laughs> Just would like to see, like to see the baby. You know, the, yeah. this is a very interesting proposition, and I'm also curious. Like the, like you can't go into category, like software is not going to be written where you can go. Add and shoot this with your lens, but I know by the metadata passing through, I shot it with my cine zoom, and I can go like on f5 and go tell you. It tells me that I was shot at 55 mil. Sure. That I type in 55 mil into there. And rather than have it automatically, I just load it in the Catalyst Browse. Well, see, the thing I and if I'm, I don't understand this, I haven't been fully briefed on the, the implementation yeah. of it, but from what I understand, it's using the gyro sensor information, so it doesn't really care about what millimeter you're at. Well, no, it, yeah, it does, it, because it, it matters on... But it's measuring pitch, and yeah. yo, it's actually accounting for but, the bounce. But it's going to bounce a lot both, different at 50 Joe. mil than yeah, it will at 120. Both. Yeah. So it, is the, it is the focal length of the lens and, and the gyro that. within the camera, which is why you need E-mount lenses yeah. for this. Okay, but yeah, I, I kind of like the closed Sony environment versus the open, like, I have a lot more money invested in lenses than I do with cameras. I understood. I understood. That's, and I'm sure you're probably getting that feedback too, but I'd love to see this, and I haven't seen it other than somebody holding up an iPhone to a monitor. Hmm. Yeah. Me too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the fact that you don't have to pay somebody, you know, a soft or sweet, you know, even if it's okay, I think I, we'll we'll <laughs> we'll get we'll do we'll do pretty well by it because this is now a democratization of something that you know this is the Fincher mode to try and shoot the camera at this point basically, and uh, it'll be interesting to see how it gets developed going out. So, and it'll also probably show up many other places. Yes. Uh, come come April. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so uh, if you're an FS7 user, you probably uh, never saw this app. If you had some of our other camcorders, probably have. It's a really cool app. It's called Content Browser Mobile. It is a, an application that's available in both iOS and Android. It's free. Uh, it can, use, uh, can be used on a uh, cell phone or tablet. I would search Content Browser Mobile, not CBM. You'll come up with a Christian broadcast type application, and that might not work so well with the camera. Um, but you will be saved. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, with uh, the FX9, it has both 5 gig and 2.4 Wi-Fi. It's built into the body, and I can simply take my cell phone if I've got a device that has NFC, I can set the camera to talk NFC. I touch the camera with my device. It opens up, it connects to the camera and opens up the app. And then you switch over to what would be uh, your monitoring. And so this is the screen you see in monitoring. So in this monitoring mode, I can record, start, stop. I can adjust zoom, focus, iris, white balance. I can use it as a viewer, maybe give it to a producer, hit this little lock button there so they don't touch your camera controls. And uh, you'll see time code on there as well. And uh, it's a nice little uh, remote type control. You can even change the base sensitivity of the camera from the 800 to the 4000. So that's Content Browser Mobile. Uh, you have to have the current version, which is out already. <laughs> it is version 3.3. Um, so we were actually a little early on that. Yeah. Um, I was able to update it on my phone, my older phone, which is in my bag. But we can show you that later as well. But great little feature. I think <laughs> you really could uh, enhance your shooting experience. But OK. So the extension unit. Uh, the FS7 series had an extension unit. Uh, feedback from that um, <coughs> was used to make a build-up kit, which we currently have available. That's the CBK FS7, I believe. 
mm -hmm. FS7BK. So it's a extension unit that adds additional audio, additional audio controls, wireless streaming, proxy file recording, all the things that the FS7 didn't have. So this XDCA already has the drop-in slot for wireless. It's going to be a 16-bit linear raw out, not 12, and additional power taps. Now, again, there's a couple of things coming later on with firmware. So realistically, unless you're using the, this for anything other than powering the camera with the uh, larger batteries, you probably won't be um, well, you won't be getting full functionality from this system until the summer of 2020 when all the major, uh, when the major firmware is released. So the, the uh, wireless audio, so it'll support both our UWP and DWX audio, so our higher end digital system, which is really amazing. A lot of our uh, broadcast uh, news partners are adapting that. Uh, you've got, again, the V-mount uh, back, an RJ45 for a more reliable connection, and then it is compatible with our XDCAM Air Dual Link uh, streaming, <coughs> uh, which basically doubles the bandwidth and reliability over our previous single link for streaming. And uh, XDCAM Air, you probably have a conversation with Joe about that offline because it's a whole... Another ball of wax. Add another computer to the computer with a lens, and we can put your video anywhere on the internet you want. <laughs> right. And, and using Exacam Air, uh, you can actually reach in and control functionality of the camera from a remote location. Uh, so is it, uh, can you get two microphones in the slide in? Yes. So it'll support dual channel. Okay. So you can literally have a total of four wireless audio sources into the FX9. Add the back, you got two from the hot shoe on top, mm -hmm. two from the XDCA on the back, and you're good to go, and you have all four dials right here on the side of the body. It's really nice. And the UWP line of Sony uh, transmitters just got refreshed. So we now have 900 megahertz uh, capability and uh, just updated, easier to use, and a smaller form factor. Mm -hmm. And a slightly smaller profile adapter to it, mm -hmm. as it sits lower on the camera. <coughs> So again, any of the firmware upgrades, oh, and that last thing, I, I'll mention it again. You can just go back sure. one more slide. It's down here on the bottom. I, I spoke about it in the beginning, but that 10-bit, 120 frame 4K, it's worth mentioning twice, because it's really, I mean, there aren't many cameras at this price point that can offer you a continuous 4K 120, and it'll be 10-bit, it'll be 10-bit rough. Yeah. So again, that'll be with the firmware upgrade, with the XDCA, and you, of course you have to go to an external recorder. Part of the weight on that is we're still working with our third-party companies to uh, record that 16-bit and that 10-bit 124K. Uh, more than likely it'll be Atomos, they are our current best partners. So just a quick review of the camera. We've got the full frame 6K sensor, brand new sensor with an XMOR R that gives you that increased dynamic range. It is still our E mount system, so all those amazing E mount lenses you had from your FS7 will work on this camera in Super 35 mode. And then if they're full frame lenses, you get to take advantage of that full width that the lens can offer you, get that more shallow depth of field. We still are using the XQD card, so you don't have to buy all brand new uh, media. Still using our uh, platform of uh, formats in terms of our codecs, our MPEG HD422, our XABC long off and intra frame, so no need to uh, change your workflow on the edit side as well. Uh, the kit comes with the SELP 28 to 135. That's this lens here. It is a constant aperture f4. It does have a mechanical focus ring if you choose now to stay using manual focus. It's like the joke of the day. Uh, and full iris ring as well. Uh, and and it's then a full frame lens. It is a full frame lens, yeah. So uh, that was the other thing when that lens was delivered with the original FS7. You get that 
narrow angle of view, and the first thing people said was, I need something wider, which is why on the FS7 M2, we went with the 18 to 110 with the, you know, crop, with the cropped lens. Uh, and then the key features, the fast hybrid autofocus, the dual base ISO, which I think those are my two favorites, and the color science, of course. Um, and then the legendary electronic variable ND, which you don't get a color shift in there, so that's really big. Are you, are you going to be able to get the uh, camera with or without the kit at the same time, or is the kit one coming out first here? Uh, I haven't heard that one is easier to, to obtain than the other. If, do you already have the lens? Yeah. Is that, yeah. yeah. I, I would imagine that there would be um, that it shouldn't be an issue. Have you heard anything? No, and I would, if, if history is any precedent, you know, body onlys tend to show up faster than bodies and lenses. Okay. Yeah. Did you pre order already? Or I have not. You have not, okay. No. So I think our initial pre orders have indicated that, you know, a lot of the orders are coming from existing FS7 users. So we're seeing a lot of body only. So that tells me that the factory would be prepared to have the bodies available. Right? And of course, the lenses are still there if you need them, but um, if you already have one, that's great. Not to sound stupid, but what's, what other lens, E mount lenses does Sony have with the full frame? Oh, uh, there's, um, see, we have about 52 E mount lenses, most of which are, are full frame. frame. I have in my bag over here, that little roller bag. So, uh, you mean the original ones that were went out with the F3 are full frame too? No, 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 those are Super 35. Those, um, so, if you didn't realize it already, Sony's a very famous and high quality lens manufacturer. Many, many years ago, we, you know, bought Konica Minolta. And with that, obtained a lot of lens technology. Since then, we built a um, billion dollar lens manufacturing plant. And uh, we're able to produce super high quality lenses. If you're not familiar with the G Master, it's the one with the red G. So prior to G Master, we had Sony G Series and Zeiss branded lenses that were on par with uh, our major competitors' lenses. And then we upped our game with the G Master. So with G Master, we actually figured out a way, and that's why you spend a billion dollars on a factory, to, um, to buffer the elements so precisely that not only were, are we creating the sharp, some of the sharpest lenses on the market, but also lent those same sharp lenses having amazing bokeh. And typically, that's very hard, if not impossible, to do. You're usually going to have a lens that's really sharp, that the bokeh is just OK, or vice versa. And I don't know if I'm saying bokeh correctly, but. Um, OK, depending on tomato, tomato. Yeah, tomato, tomato. Yeah, thank you. So having, having that, it, it says a lot. In fact, um, if you haven't seen our G Master 135 Prime, it's probably that that and the 600 are, I think are two are two of the sharpest lenses you'll ever see at least to this point in time uh, so they are e mount they have autofocus elements in them the newer the lens the faster the autofocus but I love this 24 millimeter 1.4 with this FX9 it's just it's mind-boggling how sharp it is but and then you see that nice soft background when you shoot wide open. And uh, because you're at 140, <laughs> you really, even in this environment, wouldn't even need to go into the higher base ISO. <coughs> so we have a lot of lens choices to choose from. Limited on the servo side. So on the servo side, we have one full frame and three uh, Super 35, of which one ramps. That was one of the older lenses. But we have the 18 to 110 and the 18 to 105. 18 to 105 is the kit lens for the FS5. The 18 to 110 is the kit lens for the FS7 M2. So those are your servo zooms. 
this is the 28 to 135, which now, because if you operate in full frame mode, you get that full 28 wide. And this is also for further, this is where Bob comes in at Fuji for having the, you know, an MK series where you have native, adapt, native mount zoom lenses that are price point appropriate and specification appropriate. Yeah. So yeah, you'll still be able to get your hands on, on the uh, MK series for, I think you're going to still shoot a lot with this camera in Super 35 mode. So don't throw away your Super 35 lenses. Don't, you know, think about not purchasing those lenses because they're still going to come in handy. There's still going to be plenty of situations where you're going to want to shoot Super 35. It's just really great to have that creative choice of, you know, if I'm in a small room and I need that width, I can switch to full frame. If I'm running and gunning and I want a little bit more solid depth of field, I want to be in that Super 35 mode. And it's just such a great combination. Um, you know, we've partnered up with, with uh, Fujinon for quite some time. And off that MK series, every show I've ever been to, we throw one of those on an FS7, and the comments that we get are just, it's just amazing. So quality of glass at that price point they sit at, it's really, um, it's, it's very, very nice. Which That's, lens are we referring to just uh, the, There's a Fujinon on MK series, so there's two lenses in the series. Yeah, it's 18 to 55 and 50 to 135. Correct. And they are T, uh, 2.9, 2.9, T 2.9, yeah. So and you have the heating, and then you use the heating for the motor, right? You have a uh, Crozeal, I don't know if anybody else makes it, but Crozeal makes a motor uh, that to you add can on add the, on to the, the Fuji. Yeah, and then that runs right Do into you, the... Is it easy, easy clip on off, or uh, so you can use one uh, or yes. two lenses? There's a few uh, uh, screws that hold that motor assembly on. Yeah. Uh, it just controls the zoom on. Yeah, it, it'll you can control it from the link connector from the, the Sony grip that you get. So right, but as you know, the the proprietary Sony lenses and focus. <laughs> right. You don't want to veer from that. But right? there's going to be. All right. I mean, we're still professionals. We haven't forgotten how to do manual focus, right? <laughs> now don't go using this autofocus as a crotch now. <laughs> the MK uh, lenses are far focal as well. Yeah. It's like something like 70, what, 78 or 7300 for the two of them. They run special 7895, and you get both lenses. Yeah. yeah. So my point is you still have a lot of lens choices. Uh, going with an FX9, you have the ability to shoot full frame and Super 35. Now, if we go to the next slide. Before so if, I, if, it just, the, if you shoot the uh, Fuji lenses, and you're going super 35, they are, it is an 18 to 55, and it is a 50 to 135. It, it, there's no multiplication there. It, it is what it says it is. Yes? It's a native, on my side, yes, I don't think. You're native right. super, super 35 on So you get what the lenses label as, correct? Yeah, you get what, yes. so in the full frame it would be different. Right, you, you, mul you multiply yeah, times point six. <laughs> It wouldn't work. It would vignette. It would vignette. Yeah, yeah. and we did. I did try it the other day. Yeah, you do get um, some yeah. vignetting, so you would want you to be in super thirty-five right. mode for that. One more slide. Sure. That's good. So speaking of lenses, uh, we are introducing uh, the first of a new series of cinema lenses, uh, and the idea here is we go. We we know folks love the traditional cinema lens operability, the quality you get and the control you get. Uh, what we're doing is combining that with our own technology with our alpha mount system, having the autofocus, auto exposure, and servo zoom, and giving you the choices to have those be fully manual or fully automatic or a little bit of each. And including, if you go to the next slide, whoop, one more back. So this first, this lens here will be the first in the line of a series of lenses we're introducing of our cinema lens series. So this is the FE, so that's full frame, mm -hmm. C for cinema, it's a 16 to 35 T3.1. So again, we're in T stops, not F stops, so we're getting accurate uh, measurement of the amount of light passing through the lens. And uh, it's got this servo motor here. Got a high-low switch to go faster or slower, power zoom. 
Now, in certain applications, you may want to remove this motor. That's fine. You can do that as well. Um, so this would be the first lens. I'm told it was spring of uh, 2020 uh, for availability and price around 5500 And then, of course, based on what's in the shadows, <laughs> you can see there'll be other lenses to fill out the range of focal lengths. Or do you know if those are, they look like zoom lenses? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, more than likely they'll, they'll be zoom. So we need to cover a certain range and there's, that sort there's of thing. Three motor, there's three sprocks. Yeah, there's so three right. gears yeah. there. So I'm going to say, unless they come up with a third, yeah. the third gear to position zoom. Yeah, so that is the idea. Uh, so we are officially finished with the presentation. Uh, loved how we interacted and asked lots of questions. I'm sorry I couldn't answer all of them. But uh, I'll certainly do my best to get that additional information out to you um, before I, we move on. Does anybody have any more questions? Great. Thank well, thanks, Henry. Thanks so again, much. I don't know. Feel free to come up, take a play, push buttons. We can get uh, the monitors up. And if uh, somebody in the back of the house is available, we can get the uh, FS7 up on the big screen. FS7? Uh, FX9. Ah.